Okay, Jim, so it's four, one minute past. If you want, we can begin. Please. Yes, so today it will be different because as you already know, it will be in English because we have a special guest with us. So uh, we are in the fourth um, uh, interview is not the, the name, but the, the, the fourth day we share the afternoon with Jim. Thank you, Jim, again for your time. Uh, and uh, we are going on with the topic. And I will give the word to Jim because I think that he will introduce better to Adrian than I will do. And uh, I would like also to thank Adrian for being today with us and for enriching this this afternoon. Yeah. So Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. It's wonderful to be here again with everyone. Um, those of you who are able to show up online with us today and those watching on the YouTube channel later, we know a couple hundred are approaching there. And we know that a lot of our colleagues around the world who are also watching this and connecting with me afterwards about this work um, and, and these sessions that we've been doing um, from Latin America, particularly, um, it's early in the morning for them, nine o'clock. So they're, they're watching on YouTube, but grateful to be here. And so this is our fourth session talking about the science of abundance um, with the UPM, Universidad Politécnica de Madrid, um, from the Center for Leadership and Technology. So very grateful that you've invited us in to explore um, at, a, at an initial level these issues of what does it look like, this emerging science of abundance from the level of the individual, the group, the organization and society. And today in this fourth session, very grateful to have our, my colleague, friend Adrian, we're gonna be talking about co-hosting collaboration for societal transformation, what's real about this and what is it leading to? And so here you have his email and mine. And what we'd like to do is um, thank who, who's doing this work. When, so we're gonna be talking a lot about the what we do and who's this we. So this we for us can, can includes the Center for Leadership and Technology, Isabel and team at the Polytechnic. I'm also on the advisory board of the ITD, the Center for Innovation and Technology for Human Development at the UPM, and on the School of Public Health at Harvard, and the Institute for Strategic Clarity, a nonprofit that I lead, and also a professor at the Gaia Business School in Mexico. <clears throat> and we're doing field research around the world in some of these locations. And today we're grateful to have with us uh, Adrian from Renovate Europe, Adrian and I met a few years ago on a project for Europe with Build Upon and the World Green Building Council and have been working together ever since and grateful. And so maybe Adrian, you could start by describing these three hats that you wear and give people a little sense of your orientation where you are um, for to give a little context for the comments that we'll be sharing. Uh, certainly, Jim, and good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, hello to everyone on YouTube that's watching the recording. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here and to share some of my experience and uh, knowledge on this topic of the science of abundance and how to affect societal change through uh, collaboration. Um, yeah, I have, I'm going to present three hats that I wear just so that uh, the audience has a context for who the guest is today. I am uh, the Secretary General of the European Alliance of Companies for Energy Efficiency in Buildings. This is a European industry association bringing together 14 of the largest companies that uh, manufacture and distribute products, equipment, provide services for highly energy performing buildings. And it works principally on high level EU policy in the efficiency of buildings field. The second hat I'm wearing today, and that's the main one, is I am also campaign director of the Renovate Europe campaign. And that campaign is a political communications campaign that has the objective of reducing the energy demand in the building stock of the European Union by, 20, by 80% by 2050. And it gathers together 45 partners, including 17 national partners. And we're lucky to have a national partner in Spain, uh, the Renovate España um, platform. 
The third hat I'm wearing today is I'm an architect by training and I still uh, practice through uh, my professorship at the Catholic University of Louvain-Neuve here in Belgium, where I teach third year architecture students uh, basically how to keep water out of buildings. So construction technology. So Jim, uh, there are three of the principal hats and indeed the Renovate Europe one is the one I want to emphasize today and the experience I have in, in talking with diverging voices uh, to try and bring them together behind a shared value. Excellent, <clears throat> perfect. So what I'd like to do is to link this fourth session uh, to the previous three, do that briefly reminding us of what we've seen in these others and if this is your first time with us, then just, and you can go back and watch those other videos. And I discovered this cool thing and that as a feature in the YouTube, there's a simultaneous automatically generated uh, um, subtitles that are provided for whenever we're speaking. Um, and you can click on that and it provides the translation immediately. And as we all know, those of us who do that and speak multiple languages, it's not great, it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good. So you can watch in other languages that with the subtitles in your language, um, the previous successions. And so what we're building up is from the idea of abundance, what do you know from your own experience? So we started with, you know the difference between scarcity and abundance. You know when you're feeling in a group that there's scarcity and nothing is possible and you're not really engaged and your contribution isn't really necessary and it's all about just doing what was already proven to the experience of abundance where you're much more engaged, much more excited, much more trusting, much more sharing and supporting of others and bringing their unique contributions and learning and developing um, creative solutions over time. And you know the difference in these two and you have a preference and what we're looking at is if we have a preference towards the more abundant, more engaged, higher impact, more supportive processes, then why is it in our organizations we don't do that? Why do we have so many people around the world that are disengaged at work um, and in their families? And, and is it possible to learn how to do these others? And so what we saw on the left was these five primary relationships of how I relate to myself, to another, to the group, to the process of creativity and nature, and to the source of creativity and spirit, then it requires all of these. So then we started to say, well, then if it's true that we prefer this greater abundance in our own experience, we know what that feels like and we prefer it, then what are people doing? And what we started to describe was there are groups who are living much greater out of this collaborative space. And then what are the processes and structures that they have? What are the underlying agreements that they have that allow them to do that versus what those of us who are acting and having the experience of greater scarcity and not showing up, not supporting each other, being replaceable, only doing what was already done before and not learning and adjusting, um, then what are we doing? So then how can we shift? And so then we said, okay, we, we know that this exists. We've found through our survey and field work in a lot of different countries that there are examples of a lot of people living the other way. So then the question becomes, what are they doing that is actually different? And we started to look at, well, there's an underlying framework, as I said, that all of this stuff of the experiences and the outcomes or the results we're getting all depend on how the network is set up or the set of the nodes are interrelated and interacting. And that's based on the underlying assumptions that we have about our agreement and our agreements. And then we said, okay, can we, what do we do with a group? And we said that it turns out in the second session, we said, well, we can unlock these by looking at how we engage groups so what are the factors that we use to engage the energy of the group, Con having a purpose that they actually care about, that they will give their energy towards, connecting to and remembering that this is why we're actually here, actually bringing in the different perspectives that we're trying to, and why we need each other, and then creating a space of enough trust that, towards the purpose and each other and our contributions that will actually share the creati creativity that we then can transform through our efficient and effective systems that we understand how to work with the dynamics of our system. And we have access to the resources we need to be able to continuously transform that energy that we engaged into something that others want so that we can transfer it. They actually want what we're offering and they can receive it in the form that we're offering. And so we said, as long as at the higher level that we're able to do that with groups, then more of that energy 
that we're unlocking in human creativity goes to the desired effect versus what most groups are doing because of this assumption of scarcity and the experience. And we know that through our experience of scarcity, that a lot of that energy is drained off. And that's what this graphic is trying to say. It goes to the cost of scarcity. It says, so we didn't engage much. We don't know how to transform that energy and nobody really wants what we're offering. So all of that energy that we were connected to that's available in the humans got lost, went to entropy versus it was utilized towards the purpose that we wanted. And so we had some math that said we can actually measure these things and we can start to see how we want to unlock that energy. And as a matter of fact, that there are um, a wide variety what, through our tools, we're able to see that there are very different sets of agreements and that these higher level, what we call the higher level agreements or more collaborative, cooperative to collaborative agreements actually achieve far greater outcomes per person involved. And we're going to get to see a, a very high level of that with Adrian's work in his communities today from <clears throat> you can get whatever it costs you to at a very extractive level. It is possible to get um, take a person's salary or the cost of having them. They can generate 10 to 100 times more revenue for the company and impact than what they're doing. But we're starting to see that those numbers increase to thousandfold to millionfold the higher we go. And the only point of that is to say you can you can get far more um, through people's work and depending on how you engage them. And so we started to use the tools of the scan to say we can assess where a group is through these tools on this spectrum and what life looks at that next like at the next level. And then in the third session, we said a way to shift our agreements to say, okay, we're at a level that we don't want to be. Or we see that it's poten our potential says we could do something far greater than what we're doing. Not because somebody else is doing it, but we know that something far better is available in us. And so in the third session, we went through what we called an agile vibrancy move is how do we move an organization to say, <clears throat> what is it we're trying to achieve? So that's what's in the upper left hand uh, here. Is there something that we're trying to achieve? This is what we're currently capable of doing. This is what we need to or desire to be able to do. And here's the gap. And if we really care about this gap, <clears throat> then we can start to ask the second question is, what does life look like at that next level? And I think this is where we said that there's a big difference. Most groups, most processes start to look at what is it we know from where we are about what we need to change to be able to do the next level of performance. So the mindset is from where we are, and we just need to do this faster, better, different. But from our perspective, and what we've realized in this work is <clears throat> the 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 outcomes at the next level are dependent on a set of interactions at the next level in a way of, and those processes and structures at the next level are very different than the ones at the previous level. So the second step in here is to say, what is that? Let's go explore the experience of others who are already performing at that next level. And what are their processes and structures look like? What can we recognize in those? So then when we come back and look in the third step at our own agreements, we can say, <clears throat> this is what we're not doing that we saw there. And that's what we need to shift so we can start trying. We call that agile, like in the software um, process to be able to say, go try things and see. So maybe instead of coming to a meeting and just talking at everybody and telling them what they have to go do, maybe I could actually try listening. And I noticed that the groups that are much more cooperative or collaborative, they actually listen to each other instead of just tell, yelling at each other and assuming that they know what the other is going to think. Maybe I could go try that. So what are those steps or processes to start looking at? Um, and so <clears throat> that was at the organizational level, how can we shift? And what we wanted to explore today is how do we start to do this at the societal level? And so for that, connecting all these dots is to say, some of the challenges that we're facing, these wicked problems, as my friend at, uh, Ed Brooks at the Oxford Character Project called, reminds us, said the problems that we faced generations before might have been much more structured. They were difficult things to face, but they were tamer problems that we could organize, analyze, and compartmentalize and address them because we knew what the answer looked like and we knew when we got there. But some of these more wicked problems maybe require a very different way of engaging. And if we want to go from a more scarcity-based to more abundance-based, if we want to shift our, the way we interact with each other and shift our agreements, then what does practice at this next level look like? And so here, 
I'll describe very briefly a tool that we, a process that we used in this project. You can see it was through build upon that I met Adrian and now I'll bring Adrian in is to start saying <clears throat> some of the big challenges that we face, such as um, the energy use in Europe through buildings, which is a huge number. Adrian can give some of the specifics. And how do we dramatically reduce that across a lot of member states who have very different perspectives and cultures? And how can we do this in mass, um, respecting all of those differences? And one of the things that we were invited in, my group, um, in to do but through the Institute for Strategic Clarity with the Build Upon Initiative, and in our advisory role was to say, what kind of process could we do to see if we could start getting the group together to start thinking about what is it we are trying to do? So this O process is a term people use to describe this, basically starts with step one of saying, what is it that we really, really care about? And do we know what that is? And what we found over time, and doing this in a lot of different organizations and a lot of different places around the world, is that most people start to say, oh, it's on our page three, we've described our mission statement. I said, well, first of all, if you have to go to page three and you have to remember it was, then you're not really, it's not centering what you really are and it's not something you really care about. Um, some people have learned the mantra, they can recite the mantra of shareholder value maximization, sir. And I said, okay, but that's not, do you really wake up every day? And is that what really deeply drives you about your work? And what we found over the years is that it's not, it never has been um, something that simple, but one, and two, there is something that pulls people to this work, whatever that work is. And what we found is if we can get to what that deeper or deepest shared purpose is, then that's the motivating force for change that is attracting people to this work. The second step is then to say, if this is what we're really trying to do, then what are the voices, the perspectives, the values that, that we need to be able to work with this, right? So he said, if we're going to address this kind of problem, this kind of issue, this kind of goal, then these are the perspectives that are needed. So a project we're doing in, in education, kindergarten through 12th grade education, then we need the perspective of the parents and the teachers and the children and the, 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 the school administrative systems and society and government. And you know, so the different perspectives that are all involved in this. But what this does is to say, if we really care about this, then we really care also about the perspectives that are being brought to the table. You're not my enemy, <clears throat> you're bringing a perspective that's also needed. And this dramatically shifts then how I need to listen to you. So then from that, we can start to say, then let's understand the possibilities that each of us can see in service to what we're trying to do. And that can bring us to a shared possibility, which for design folks is very obvious. That's when we say, I see what you're pointing at. And we can all somehow look up and say, I can see this shared possibility that we're all starting to describe. And now when we bring that back into, into reality, we can say, okay, we convert as a friend of mine says from possibilities to probabilities is starting to say, I can see now I need to know from each of these perspectives, what is it that you see from your training, your lenses of, of how to start manifesting this, then what is your commitment to doing to making a contribution to that? And then how are we going to take this into action together? Because we're going to have to go shift some things in our own context. And so what this works through is working from what is the deeper intention that binds us how do we relate with each other out of a space of respect um, and in cognition, what can we see from of our perspectives and bring that all together? So that's called the O process. Um, that is a continued, continuous iterative process. Um, the difficulty there is it seems pretty obvious to most people who do organizational development work says, sure, we do that. And I say, well, you actually don't. Um, when we observed your meetings, you came in and told people, well, this is what I saw and this is what I think you need to do. And so what are you going to go do? And so you're starting with step four. You didn't really invite folks in to say, is this your purpose? What is, how do we define our purpose? How do we define our values and contributions? How do we define the understanding of possibilities from each of the perspectives that we're bringing? And they have to be different and we need each other. And how do you do that in real life? It, we went and got to test that with Build Upon. And Adrian's been involved in all of that all along. Um, and so that, that's that sort of the abstract concept of how do we co-host, meaning how do we support this kind of process happening in a group? So Adrian and I, we went with a group and did um, 
spent a couple of days in Cambridge walking through a lot of practice of how, how are we going to do this? And then we met in Madrid, I think now three years, three or four years ago with a group of a hundred plus leaders from across all of the industry, in, in, in energy efficiency and building renovation um, industry to say, what is it that we're really trying to do and why do we need each other? And so we got to practice or apply it in that process. And so that's the build upon piece. So with all of that set up of connecting to the previous sessions and this idea that at a societal level, we can co-host, we can be host with um, a collaborative process so that the, we can see why, why we need each other and that we need each other so that we can see something far more. With all of that prelude, I welcome you, Adrian. Um, any initial comments you have, and then I'd love to start exploring um, for a few minutes your experience of both in the, the build upon piece and then more generally in your recent work, um, this capacity to get people to align to a deeper purpose and why they need each other. Anyway, so I'll open up to you after that long prelude. Thank you, Jim. And indeed, uh, your prelude leaves a lot of food for thought and brings back some very pleasant memories of the work we did together, as you mentioned, in both Cambridge and in Madrid. And I would maybe start by saying <clears throat> I'm one of those people who, before we met, uh, didn't really think about the process or question the power of collaboration or how you understand where your power lies as a collaborative um, platform, which is what the Renovate Europe campaign is. And that since we met and since I uh, gained an understanding of the old process, it has been very informative to my work on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it has helped to really improve the impact of the campaign because we're more thoughtful about our progress, we're more thoughtful about how we describe our possibilities and probabilities. I like, I very much like that uh, differentiation. And uh, it has allowed us to be, I suppose, the, 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 the EU word to use is smarter about what we do as we uh, move forward in our field. So maybe it's worth uh, moving away from the abstract uh, for a few moments, just to talk about the challenge <clears throat> that the Renovate Europe campaign was set up to address. And uh, knowing that the audience is probably quite a general audience and I'm quite a specialist on buildings, I'll try to use language that's, uh, that's easily uh, comprehended uh, by, a, by a broader audience. So the reality is that, of course, we all know our buildings because we all live and work and take leisure time in our buildings. But we all don't think about our buildings. And we in the industry and indeed in academia, and as an architect, I've spent my lifetime thinking about buildings and about the qualities of buildings. And when you start investigating those qualities, you realize that uh, in the European Union, uh, our use and occupation of buildings is consuming 40%, so that's four zero, 40%, nearly half of all the energy used in the EU. And in using that energy, because most of it is fossil fuel based, we're emitting 36% of the CO2 uh, into the atmosphere that's causing climate change and climate warming. So these are the kind of societal motivational aspects uh, that stand behind the Renovate Europe campaign. The campaign itself was set up in 2011 as a political communications campaign in response to what was perceived as the, at the time as a missed opportunity in uh, the revision of a European directive, the European law about buildings. In that law, the main provisions applied to new buildings. And we as a group of stakeholders realize that actually, <clears throat> if you're interested in the energy performance or the energy use in buildings, it's not new buildings that are the real problem. It's the vast number of existing buildings by uh, most of which have been built long before there was any understanding of energy 
uh, use of where energy was plentiful and cheap and you didn't think about insulating or ventilating right or recirculating air and ca capturing the heat from the recirculated air, etc. So we uh, understood as well that in Europe, buildings have a very long lifespan. And in fact, the current demolition rate of buildings in Europe is running at about uh, less than 0.2%, uh, oh. which gives a kind of a 500 year life span to our buildings. So that, think about that, that, when you start thinking about the building stock, you begin to realize how it's such a, a foundation stone for society, for activity in, in, in society, for our well-being, for our shelter, and for all of those aspects. So link that then <clears throat> to the big societal question and the big realization that has come in say the last 10 years and in the middle of those 10 years, the Paris Agreement on uh, climate change, where almost all countries in the world have signed up to tackle climate change in such a way that by the middle of this century, 2050, we don't exceed uh, an increase of average temperature of 1.5 degrees, certainly not two degrees. Uh, and if we want to get there, we need to cut CO2 emissions dramatically. And one of the main sectors or segments that can really contribute are buildings because we're responsible for 36% of those CO2 emissions. But what the campaign in its founding years realized is that it's not just about making the buildings more energy efficient and more uh, therefore more comfortable, but it's, it's delivering back to society what we call multiple benefits that go beyond the technologies and the materials that are put onto and into buildings to make them highly energy efficient. It has been found that, <clears throat> and there are many studies on this now, at the time we started, we were groundbreaking on multiple benefits, but I give you a couple of examples. It has been found and shown that if you do a good energy upgrade to school buildings, you increase the learning capacity of the children in those schools or the pupils. And that's been quantified for primary schools on average, you could shorten the school year by two weeks because of a better indoor uh, environmental quality through uh, integrated renovation. In hospitals, a very topical uh, building type at the moment, you can reduce um, stay times uh, by 10%. In other words, people stay le recover more quickly. And if you monetize those, because unfortunately, uh, you talk about values, Jim, unfortunately our world tends to revolve around money and uh, the dollar or the euro. But if you monetize the health, um, the, those benefits of reduced stay times in hospitals, it's estimated that you can generate 50 billion euro back into the economy each year in the European Union. 50 billion euro, it's a very big sum. So the campaign um, has used those multiple benefits in its communications because our target of those communications, and that's maybe where we can begin to come back to the power of co-hosting and, and, and about careful thinking, our targets were the EU policymakers and decision takers who in 2011, when we started, very rarely, if ever, mentioned a renovation of buildings within policy circles. There was no awareness of what I've just outlined to this audience about the impact of buildings on our lives, on our energy use uh, for climate change. And in the campaign, we have tried over the years to craft our messages to raise that awareness through positive messaging. And I think that's really important. We, re we have always been positive in our messaging. We've never leaned on fear tactics, which some other campaigns do, uh, or they highlight the negative or the, 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 the other face of the coin. No, we've always been um, promoting what is um, going to benefit uh, society as a whole through adopting a societal approach to this problem and challenge of energy waste in buildings. 
So I hope that gives a, a grounding for the audience to understand where I'm coming from. And maybe I could talk a little then about the partnership, Jim, if that would make sense, because the initiators of the Renovate Europe campaign were indeed my own member companies. But very quickly, we looked along the construction value chain and we invited in architects, contractors, uh, trade unions, city networks, energy agency networks uh, to have a much broader audience uh, within our partnership. And it was when we started to onboard uh, other uh, industrial sectors like um, the chemical sector are a partner of the campaign. When we started to onboard um, uh, research uh, people trying to transfer technologies into the market, which was not necessarily our uh, direct concern, we then began to have that need to discuss the divergent voices and to realize, which we fortunately realized very quickly, is that in such a sector as the building sector, actually, if we don't get everybody on board, we're just simply not going to succeed in achieving our objective, which we had set then around that time, 2012, as working to get an 80% reduction in the energy demand of the building stock by 2050, which would mean cutting CO2 emissions by 32% and cutting energy use by 38, 34% in the EU as a whole by simply addressing our sector. But we quickly realized that the, without those uh, divergent voices coming together behind our message, uh, our deeper, deeper shared purpose, we would be already bound to fa failure. Mm. So we had many conversations with our partners around, you know, individual words in how you describe your purpose, how you describe the values, how do you communicate the benefits that are coming along. And we learned early on that uh, different perspectives are valuable because they put pressure on your kind of assumptions on what you have brought with you as your personal baggage. And then they enrich it uh, by helping you to open your mind towards another person, point of view. And hopefully their mind is being open towards your point of view. So it's a dynamic process that we, we have. And this kind of dynamic collaboration builds strength and trust between the partners so that then you feel more and more comfortable within the group. And uh, that really worked very effectively for us in the early years, and we had quick successes. It was later, and this, this I think links Jim, to a point you made under the third uh, session last, last time around, we realized that certain aspects of the way we were communicating were alienating some of our target audience. Mm. So we undertook a structured review with external experts on communication to understand better how to attract a broader audience. And in that exercise, we rebranded, sounds obvious, but we also changed the language that we were using. And quickly, we gathered uh, well over 100 champions among members of the European Parliament who were drawn from six different political groups and at the mm -hmm. time, 21 member states. And that allowed us with that to be able to say to all comers, look, the topic we're talking about is not a corporate interest or vested interest. No, this appeals and is relevant across the political spectrum to all people in society. And it helped us then to say in our messaging that when we come to develop strategies around how to achieve our objectives, so more at member state or even city level, that those strategies must be put in place to survive local or national elections and uh, that they have to be, therefore, all party strategies where you, even if you're a conservative government, you invite in the opposition and together create the strategy so that it will survive the next election and then you will have long life for the strategies. Because in the building sector, a project from inception to completion 
is a minimum of two years and it's generally three to four years. So you must have time to uh, allow for policies and programs to bed in. So Jim, I think maybe that's a moment to, to stop and be, ask you to provoke me with a question <laughs> because um, I think Perfect. I've got kind of a feel for where I've been and the journey exactly. I've been on. And uh, yeah, I'm ready to answer. Perfect. So what I'd love to do is to poke at a couple things, but to, to start that, to talk with where you got to. Mm -hmm. So in 2018, um, I forget the exact language, so, but you, you can share. So by 2018, um, there was an actual outcome to all that work. Sure. So I'd like to sort of say, so there was a, a fruit at the end of this path, and then we can go back and say, well, then how did we get there? And what mm -hmm. were some of the ways that you found that work and don't work in that? But so that campaign led to what happened and came across in 2018. So you can word it. And OK, so within the European context, um, there is a central European law called the, I call it the Buildings Directive, uh, and it was uh, slated for a review in 2016. Now, we knew this review was coming up when we established the campaign. So we spent those first five years raising awareness, doing our research, uh, getting our messaging uh, fine-tuned. And when the opportunity for re revision came, al came along, of course, we then engaged uh, with all of the policymakers and decision takers across what turned out to be a two-year process uh, to the adoption of revisions to the directive. And in those revisions, we were instrumental. I wouldn't say we were fully responsible, but we were instrumental as a group to including in, those, in that revision uh, two things. One, a vision for the building stock in the European Union by 2050. And that vision is not exactly worded like our vision, our shared common purpose, but it's close enough. Because now all member states are required to transform their buildings to being highly energy efficient and decarbonized by 2050. And that for us is equivalent to the 80% energy reduction. So now it's a legal requirement. The second thing we achieved uh, very clearly in the directive was a requirement on member states to develop what are known as long-term renovation strategies that would describe in detail with an action plan how that country, each country, will transform its building stock from where it starts today, and each member state has a different starting point, to all of the buildings being highly energy efficient and decarbonized in 2050. And that, that those strategies would include milestones in 2030 and 2040, against which you could measure progress as you go along. Because there's no point having a 30 plus year horizon and not checking as you go along how you get there. So we were instrumental in, uh, in that. Uh, I wouldn't say we were solely responsible for it. Hey, well, that would be more of this network-based approach to say we were influential but a lot of other people needed to step up and do their work too. But we were, we were an instrumental part of this. So what I understand in my, is that all new buildings need to be nearly net zero. Yep. And, and the whole building stock needs to be renovated all by 2050. Yep, exactly. Yeah, uh, the directive had already this requirement for all new buildings to be nearly zero energy buildings. And that actually finally comes into full force on the 1st of January 2021. So no one listening should be delivered a new building next year that isn't nearly zero energy, meaning hardly any energy bills whatsoever. But this was not the case for existing buildings. And how um, many buildings are we talking about? Just to give folks a scope, and then we'll go back to the co-hosting collaboration piece. But how, what is the scope of how many buildings are we talking about and what kind of investment is this going to require? Yeah, oh, investment. So across Europe as a whole, it's estimated that there are 210 million buildings. So there's a very high number of buildings. It is estimated that to uh, do a good energy renovation, so around 60% reduction, uh, which is not meeting quite our target, you would have to be spending an average of 35,000 euro per unit. Uh, so I didn't do the maths before this call, but we're in the 14 trillion euro uh, range, 
uh, across a 30 year period. So uh, five, 600 billion per year uh, needs to be invested in renovating buildings. So, and the numbers being talked about at European level today are a bit lower than that. They're maximum 360 billion, but they're very large sums of money, whatever way you cut, cut it. And it's a very large challenge. So without having everybody on board, we simply aren't going to uh, uh, succeed. Excellent. And that's what I wanted to get to next is to say, so that it's not that, well, that sounds like a really nice goal, Adrian, but nobody's ever going to buy this. You say, well, actually, it's in the directive now. Mm -hmm. So at the political level and across all member states, it is in the directive now. And, and that has um, bite to it. So it has to be done. And, 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 and we've got the collaboration of all these folks to be able to do that. So then one of the things that I, I've understood that you found along the way is there's a lot of process um, that happens at your level. So the mm -hmm. European level, Brussels and all of the European level across all of these different stakeholders and groups and levels and at the national level and then the very local level. And a lot of that process leads to what you were saying of and, and the healthy versions of those processes lead to lowest common denominator. What is the minimum that we can accept that will at least move us forward um, from each of our own different perspectives of us each doing our own thing versus what does it take when that versus how do you bring folks together to say, actually, we can do this, that there is a, and you described earlier, this whole process of getting everybody to say, well, this is ours and we can actually do this thing. And, it, but, and part of what we were able to do, he said, well, I don't know if I'm gonna buy into that. I said, well, look at who's at the table. Look who's in the process already. And so we have this massive buy-in and onboarding of this process. So I'd like you to you know, d describe a little bit your experiences or what you're observing of sort of more what normal processes lead to versus what is this? How does one come at it from a much more collaborative space? Um, mm -hmm. Just to differentiate a little bit to say, you know, this is what we believe um, led to the ability to get to that outcome that you just described. Well, Jim, you know that I have done some thinking around what you just call the lowest common denominator in collaborative networks, um, even the highest common denominator, and my belief that achieving the highest common denominator is still a failure uh, because then you're not activating the dynamics that you can learn from each other and use each other's energy to go higher and beyond uh, your highest uh, common denominator. And how do we do that? I suppose our, the crude way we, we, we started with that was we in the campaign office would try to understand the, 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 mo the motivation for each of the partners to say, yes, I can buy into this overall uh, vision because the motivation was different depending on the, the stakeholder. Uh, in some cases, they were buying in because they want to protect their, the interests of their uh, constituency. And let me use an example. Uh, one of the, the, the trade unions representing building and woodworkers is, very, is really, really focused on high quality standards and safety on construction sites and they would be on board in order to ensure that if there's a large increase in construction activity, that it doesn't lead to lowering of those standards. Let's just take that as an example. That's not central to our concerns. However, they can buy into it because by being uh, on board with us, we can exchange with them uh, 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 and exchange with them to understand their uh, motivation and weave that message into our narrative and what has happened is uh, on that particular point, we now rarely, I think never, speak about increasing ambition in renovation without also upskilling workers and ensuring high quality on, uh, of the works and on building sites. So this is how you kind of negotiate and get more from each other instead of pulling apart uh, within uh, a collaborative network. And I, and I suppose um, within different segments of the industry side, so you would have people who are interested only in ventilation or people only interested in more double glazing. That's, that tech, more technical level is a little easier to manage because businesses see that if the rate and number of projects increases, 
then their market potential increases. And that tends to be their main uh, driver. So I would say that in the nine years that I've been working in this topic, even the industry side, the companies, they have become much more conscious of their role as companies within their own processes and operations to be directly contributing to uh, cl mitigating climate change impacts. And so they're, mu they're much more willing to engage with a campaign like ours, calling for um, though, uh, using climate change mitigation arguments instead of market growth arguments. So there are these moldings that go on and evolve over time that as the campaign leader, I've tried to be keep abreast of and never be surprised by a partner who comes forward with a, with a, a view that then becomes extremely difficult to incorporate. So um, constant communication, not only to the outside, but within the steering group, with the, between the, the members is crucially important. And the courage to be able to say, hang on, do we still really mean this as our objective? Shouldn't it now change to become, or shouldn't it evolve to become uh, slightly different or to take account of the achievements we've had to date? And it brings me to mention something that I think is, 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 has played into our hands, I think I would have to say that. And that's the tragedy of the COVID crisis because the, this tragedy has led to a, a major economic challenge for the globe and for Europe in particular, and has led the European Commission to come forward with its recovery and resilience uh, uh, facility for which large sums of money are going to be mobilized in the next three to five years, much of which could be dedicated to buildings. And because of this tragedy, in fact, the message about the place of renovation has become even more important politically. And we've been able to be at the table discussing with the highest uh, decision makers how to go about uh, activating renovation markets across Europe. And that in large part because of the very good work of our national partners in 17 member states. So Jim, I don't know if I've drifted off the topic of the question, but these dynamics, they're constantly changing. And I, I have observed in other, in other networks or platforms that if you don't try and keep up to date with these ripples and waves of the dynamics in the context you're working in, you get left behind very quickly and you become irrelevant to your partners, and then the partnership, they begin to drift away. And those the, the vigilance around being aware of the, the general policy context and aware of the interests of the partners supporting you financially, as well as in terms of uh, events and so on, is a crucial, is crucial to success, I would say. Excellent. So in your, for yourself and experiencing um, how your co-host, what we're calling co-hosting collaboration and your ability to do this, what sort of shifted for you, uh, what can you see has shifted for you over the years and how you think about what you're doing? Um, and I, if it's appropriate to say, you know, one is we have a very clear idea and I'm very good at communicating what the idea is to convince other people to it. And can I get you to my idea versus a, an opening and a listening and adjusting because I'm trying to create a much larger space that we need each other to play in. So I just sort of curious what you see is in your own experience of doing that, um, has anything shifted for you or, or how are you understanding what you're doing in that space? Well, I think it has shifted because I think initially um, I was more single-minded about the objective and about how it could be achieved and I suppose as time goes by, I've realized that um, single-mindedness is not necessarily uh, the best way forward in the kind of world we live in today. So um, listening to other points of view, trying to step into other shoes, trying to be evidence-based uh, in a time of, uh, of va vast quantities of unvetted information flowing around uh, seems to pay dividends in the medium term. Uh, I think I've learned that over time. And 
I mean, I would like to talk about one part of the value chain that has been very uh, informative for me to work with, and that's the owners of buildings. So owners of buildings, uh, particularly those who own smaller uh, apartment, uh, you know, maybe six or eight small apartment buildings and on whom their pension relies, the income from that is their pension, are possibly the most difficult audience for the message we're putting forward because uh, certainly at the outset, they felt that we were imposing on them with a kind of an ideal about where the building stock should go and that our imposition was going to be costly for them because they would have to foot the bill. So over the years, I've observed that this approach from the owner's side has changed and it has changed for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is our work with them to help them to understand that society is changing. It's moving away from a purely uh, dollar-based or euro-based uh, approach. And that the value of their, uh, their assets sits in the quality of their assets. And if their quality of their buildings degrades, then the number of people they can market to also reduces so significantly that they undermine their own market, uh, their own, yeah, their own market. So we think that this is, has got through because now owners are asking to be heard more clearly and they accept that the building stock must be upgraded. And a second area where we've been able to help is we've done a great deal of work on funding and helping uh, owners and other uh, groups to understand what kind of EU funding is available, how to ask for it without actually helping them do the work, but opening their eyes to the fact that, okay, there is an imposition that's coming here, but no, it's coming with the means to do it that doesn't have to come 100% from my pocket. And yes, we can actually talk about changing the regulation so it's a co-benefit with the own occupiers, my tenants, and I share the burden to an extent because we both benefit to an extent. So these conversations were in unthinkable eight years ago and they're happening today. So we do see this evolution over time. And it's a bit about patience and about listening. Uh, maybe listening is something we don't do nearly enough of within the business world because we tend to be convinced that our solution is the right solution. And so we want to impose it on others but there are thousands of right solutions. And often it's the combination of five or six of those solutions in one project that produces the optimum outcome. And we I try- love yeah. I love that. Because one of the ways I would characterize that is, you said, so people say, oh, so then you're gonna go into this process and you're just gonna listen to a bunch of people and you'll come up with something completely different. And I said, well, that's not actually what happens when it's working at its best. What we've mm -hmm. discovered is I, I'm very clear on the direction we're moving which I described in earlier sessions as, right, this is what we're shooting for, right? So far less impact in healthier buildings um, and being economically intelligent about how we do that. So it's a smarter solution to, and a healthier solution for us. Um, I, so I'm clear on the direction, but I'm also clear that I need what you can also see. And so I can't see all of it. And so I actually need you to contribute. Now I'm not, you, so, the weaker version would say, well, I'm going to go into this collaborative space, but what that means is you're going to sway me on what we actually care about. Mm -hmm. so I'm not buying on that. I am saying, though, I don't have the only solution or a, or a more rigorous solution to what I actually want. The, more, the, the bigger ambitious goal um, needs the difference in perspectives that owners can bring versus the technicians can bring versus legislators can bring versus... You know, so there are a lot of different perspectives. We need to see how can we do this together in a way that's really smart for all the perspectives that's really smart towards what we're trying to achieve. And so it's not submitting to whatever people come up with as the purpose, the direction is clear and we can refine that, but then how we're going to go about that can be much enriched. And, and, and by imposing this is the only solution, well, we've seen what that gets. And one of the things I love about that initial slide I had of the, 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 the goal of what we're trying to do. He said, well, well, we know what pushing my own solution does. Mm -hmm. That's our current reality. But we're shooting for something that's far different than what we've already achieved. 
And so maybe this is another way to try it to say, well, the direction's clear, the goal is ambitious, the gap is huge. And can we work together to find a different solution that is satisfying or smart for multiple folks at the same time, multiple perspectives? Um, and, and then as you described, you know, what do I need to do in listening to say, you know what, I'm actually smarter because of who I was able to put in the room to invite into the room and engage because they saw that I actually was listening. Because what we find to finish that up is a lot of folks say, I'm not even going to go into that room because you have an already listening for what I'm going to say. You think you know what I'm going to say, and it's not what I'm going to say. It's not mm -hmm. what I actually care about, but you're not listening. And when we can get to say, well, what if they could, and we give them the experience that I said, they can also start to say, well, maybe I can also listen. And maybe I'll be smarter because I was in the room with people who actually care about this purpose. And that smarter means I can see a different shared possibility because we were together that we can act and enact something because I don't have all of the dimensions of what's needed. Um, and to be able to do that as a leader says, I don't have all the dimensions for the solutions that could actually shift this whole thing. Um, and I'm clear on the direction, then I can listen and invite and engage clear that we're delivering something. So it's not just to have a nice conversation over coffee. Right? They said, no, we're not just doing that. This is about doing something huge. And that's why I wanted you to start with the impact that it's having the seriousness of the number of buildings, the mm -hmm. amount of resource that's going to go into it to say, but we can do this. And a lot of people have signed up to that. Um, what I'd love to do is shift gears a little bit. Um, we're about an hour in, we have another half hour, um, about 15, 20 minutes. We have some questions, I think, Isabel, um, and, and engage others. And what are they seeing? What are they asking? Around yes, they are. we have a few questions in the chat. Perfect. Um, okay, one is that you spoke about the impact of energy in the schools. Uh, do you know about higher education institutions? What about the university? So thank you for the question. I don't recall <clears throat> if the research that we uh, based our numbers on um, included higher education institutions, um, but I can't imagine that uh, it wouldn't also apply because it's about the quality of the indoor environment and the comfort that you feel and the level of lighting and daylighting that you have. That, may, that, that response to you as a human, as a, as, a, as, as a sentient being, that means your performance improves. So nowadays <laughs> with online teaching, I'm afraid those benefits are lost. Uh, it's probably the opposite for many, many people because our homes have tended to be neglected in terms of those qualities uh, and commercial buildings and public buildings, at least the newer ones tend to be higher quality. So. I would have to go back and check my source on that one, uh, Isabel. Okay, thank you. And here we have a question from Adriana saying how the campaign and renovation process is working in alliance with culture change. How people is going to be involved, to learn how to be more aware about energy efficiency and create a new way to manage. I think that's a very... Involved Very good one. Yeah. Question, indeed. <clears throat> so one of the things I've learned over the years is managing change is, uh, or system change is a misunderstood concept. And Jim has helped me to understand that quite well. And when we want to, I mean, I used to consider system change as being knocking everything down and starting from scratch again. And actually that's not what it's about. It's about looking at a system and saying, uh, what is it that the system should be delivering? And asking the question, is it delivering that, uh, that result that you want? And if the answer is no, and it's nearly always no, then you have to go back along the steps of the process that are delivering that output and see where along that chain things are going wrong. And where it's going wrong, you change that part of the chain. And then you look to see if the output is uh, achieving what you expect it to give in the system. And therefore, uh, and if it is, well and good. If it's not, then you go back and take the process over again. And you do this iterative process until you get to an optimized output from the, from the system. So managing, but managing change, and I was going to make that point, um, 
One of the scariest things in collaborative networks for those who participate is the discomfort of having to step out of the way they've been doing things all their lives. And one of the things that the wise of, the, of, of our species say is, there is no life without change. So all of our lives is a constant process of managing change. And they sometimes can seem to be small and imperceptible, and sometimes they're very dramatic, such as in the COVID uh, pandemic that we're experiencing. But managing change, I don't know, I, I haven't thought directly about it, uh, it's such a powerful question, but I, I, it, managing change, I wouldn't wish it to be uh, an approach where someone or some group believes they understand what the change should be, but rather that they would discuss and negotiate with those who must change what they're willing to change and and try to bring them along. Um, because what you want to do is you don't want to, uh, yeah, you want to, you, you want to kind of deliver to people and to society what they need or what they know they need and not what you think they need, if I'm making sense. Because if you try to impose what you think they need, you're definitely going to go wrong. So when new people, come on board in a collaboration, there's always a kind of a settling period or a disruption period where their thinking and their ways of going about um, communicating, even as simple as that, have to be negotiated between the group and the new participant. And then if that, and that negotiation, fortunately in our case has always been successful to date. And then by, by incorporating that newer approach or view, you strengthen the impact that you get uh, going forward. And I've seen that time and again within our uh, partnership, because often you'll get a new partner who, who's come in over the years, and the first thing they want to do is hold an event on their topic and not on the topic of the campaign. So you work with them, and yes, you incorporate it into an event that's coming forward, but the event is about our objective in which their role is then highlighted. And that's different to their event taking, uh, taking on their interest. And that's, I suppose, how we've tried to involve uh, and learn from each other and to manage change within the dynamic of our uh, partnership over the years. And uh, yeah, because of the outcomes we're getting, I think we're, we've proven to be successful to date. And I constantly worry about maintaining that level of success moving forward, because I make no assumption that what are doing, what we're doing today, will remain relevant in the future, unless we we keep um, vigilant about about that moving forward. So I hope that answers the question. Um, for to Adriana, um, it's 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 always difficult to to answer these completely. Um, yeah, and maybe the culture change part is that bit where you're incorporating someone's interest to, to, uh, into your main objective uh, road. So, yeah, culture change is, is a tricky one. Okay, thank you, Adrian. And here we have another question. You have a big curiosity because you gave impressive data. Is it the same in other countries? Do we no. need to renovate the buildings the same? Uh, does it affect the cultural approach? Because from the cultural point of view, we don't have the same <laughs> behaviors in all the countries. So mm -hmm. maybe can you explain this? Is it, how is yeah. it different? So, I mean, maybe the best way to illustrate it is by a couple of stories, um, because I think stories are very telling. Um, and you're absolutely right. It is not the same in each and every country. And there's always a different starting point in terms of the type of building, the way they're used, their disposition, how, how people appreciate the building stock, um, how they value the building stock. And when you try to motivate, say, a municipality or a region to undertake uh, an ambitious renovation uh, of their building stock, you find that the different approaches are needed in different areas. So I'm going to compare and contrast two, one that might be familiar to some of the audience in Spain and one that possibly unfamiliar. So in the Basque region, 
of Spain. One of the difficulties that they face in society is they have a very, uh, an aging population, I understand, but it's a highly mountainous and uh, region where lots and lots of the buildings are difficult to access because there are no lifts, uh, there's lots of stairs and the streets are steep and so on. So in the Basque region, there has been a strong tendency for older people to move out and go into homes, putting pressure on the health services in that region. So the region devised already five or six years ago, uh, a very detailed program for renovation of the building stock to make it more accessible. This was the prime motivator, but in doing it, because they knew they were going to impact on the building structure, they added energy renovation to this accessibility. So because of that cultural uh, and topographical uh, need within the Basque region, they went at energy renovation via accessibility so that older people would be able to stay and would wish to stay longer in their homes, which from a societal perspective is easier to manage and less expensive. But contra contrast that to the Netherlands uh, up in the north of Europe, where there's a great deal of uh, interest in the general population around new design and new looks and, uh, you know, uh, being, yeah, being uh, innovative and forward-looking. And in the Netherlands, uh, an industrialized approach to uh, energy renovation of buildings has emerged, where in undertaking the work, the contractor only needs to be at the building for four or five days to do a complete renov energy renovation of the building. And the motivation there was twofold. One, we can come in and in one week, reduce your energy bill to zero, because that's the objective, zero energy bills. And at the same time, give your building a really smart new look. And so selling the look of the building was almost as powerful as getting the zero energy bills. So a very different approach and it required a different technical solution in each case. So it's just two examples, but it is a, a constantly fascinating part of my job is trying to understand the differences across the 27 cultures within the European Union member states and to realize that even within countries that we see as coherent and, and, and whole, there are regional differences. And that's definitely the case in Spain. It's the case here in Belgium. It's the case, but not spoken about so much in Austria and Germany and so on. So yeah, no, the differences are huge. And we've learned uh, in the Renovate campaign that you definitely can't have one size fitting all and that you should, you, you should be ready to accept that the motivation to end up with a highly energy efficient building may not be energy savings, but maybe one of these other aspects uh, moving forward and we're ready then to say well that doesn't matter to us because we we achieve our objective through a new means and a means that's appropriate culturally or technologically in uh, in that country or that region so i hope that answers the question isabel hey, thank you very much adrian we have a new question from adriana could you tell us some experience you have had that illustrate how to deal with differences between members of a community in a process where the vision and interests are different and made it difficult to make agreement about improving the energy efficiency, uh, how to manage conflicts in communities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this, this question for me uh, raises the question, I suppose, of motivation of the different actors, because some of us are motivated by the, the desire to have, um, um, to have a better world, so to have an impact on climate change mitigation. So more of that societal uh, desire but it seems to be in our Western society that it's more motivating for ha to have an individual benefit. And so if you have two people, uh, in, so that you know, the individual benefit being my home is more comfortable, it's got a higher value, 
if and when I sell it, I'll get a higher profit than I would have otherwise done. So these mo uh, motivations are um, uh, have to be you have to negotiate, as you say in your question, how do you deal with the differences between members of a community uh, in in a process where the vision and interest are different? So I think in my experience, all of the partners that I've dealt with, the vision is shared. So, but the interest that they want to get from achieving the vision is, is different, at least when they come on board first. And I think what, what tends to happen is by engaging with them and by bringing them into the process, their views can evolve and change through observation or exchange with others who have the different point of view. And what I've always tried to do is make sure, and I, and I have succeeded to date, that those exchanges are take place in an atmosphere of trust and confidence where there's no need for uh, tempers or loud voices, uh, where we listen respectfully to each other while allowing everyone to come forward with their own perspective and their own voice, as, as Jim calls it. And uh, yeah, I think, th yeah, it's just that way. It's, it's the way of being open to others that uh, allows you to overcome differences. Now, I would have to say I have not dealt with differences that are so far apart that it's really like resolving a conflict in a war zone. And that can happen within policy circles. But I have dealt with uh, certain stakeholders who've been worked up enough to, you know, slam the table to make a point. Um, and I, I have, oh, I've learned a long time ago that uh, responding to aggressive words with aggressive words gets us nowhere. So, uh, yeah, I think these are almost personal qualities that, that, that you, you, you draw on in the heat of the moment uh, that uh, allows you to broker those, uh, those situations. And to date, touch wood, I think I've always managed it in my own career. So I hope that answers your question, Adriana. It's a, tri it's, it's a difficult one. And I don't know if Jim has thoughts on that question because it, it cuts to the heart of some of the collaborative dynamics that we've spoken about over the years. It does. I think to, it, it, because it's a human process and it leads to something process, right? So, and I think what we've, what I've seen is people believe, well, we just need an answer and we're not going to do that human process stuff, right? Or it's all about the human process stuff, but it never leads to anything. Mm -hmm. And trying to connect those dots, he said, as you have, he said, if you actually can go in and say, listen, are you engaging in this bigger thing that we're trying to do? that has these multiple aspects. So it's about, it's not just, well, we're gonna reduce carbon that's emitted in the you said greenhouse gas. Some people get really excited about that. He said, well, we are doing that, but it's also about how you feel in your building. So when you're sitting in class or you're sitting in your house, you actually feel better and your bills lower. So mm -hmm. it's getting the smarter dimensions of the fullness of the experience that we can start to say, this is what I'm inviting you into. And if you're interested in this space, then we want to also know what you're contributing, what you can see in this. And so, but that requires these human capacities that we believe um, some of us are really good at, uh, but all of us have these capacities to actually relate to another human being, to actually relate to something we care about, to actually be able to listen and engage with others. Um, and they said, do we care enough about our future, this future state that we see, that we want to engage in, how are we going to do it? And I think a lot of, if we don't, we say, well, I'm not going to listen to you and I don't really care. Then I, at the end of the day, we're saying, if you don't combine the people part of it and the technical part of it, then you're saying, I don't really care about that future. And what we're seeing is to sort of summarize that saying yes to that future state that we can achieve this, saying yes to we can achieve this together, saying yes to how we're going to be together so that we can work through the difficult issues and solutions to a better solution, that is far better and cheaper than saying no. We get a far better impact, a far better outcome. So that the, the, the benefit side is far greater if we do that than if we don't. And it's actually cheaper because trying to do this with everybody doing it on their own, 
Uh, it takes an extraordinary amount of effort and we still don't get to that outcome. So it's very expensive to say no to people and to no to the future and no to people and no to listening and engaging. So no to the human side and to the technical side, it turns out to be a lot more expensive and we don't get the solutions that we're looking for at this scale. So I think it, it, the capacity to bring those to this work is really important of, can we get to something that we will do and we need different perspectives? And that's a hard, that's a challenging thing, but a lot of people have the skill sets to be able to do that. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. okay, so I don't know if there is anyone that want to add any question. We don't have more questions in the chat, but maybe uh, someone wants to add something since we are not many people you can get the mic and you can speak if you want. No more questions. Excellent. Well, I'd love, I, I want to invite, thank you, Isabella. What I, and if people do have a question, we still have a little time, but to invite folks to visit um, and, and engage with us um, on the top of this slide for those watching now or on the YouTube, the Bitly co-hosting build upon um, leads to um, a set of interviews that we did um, when we were all together, um, I think back in Brussels um, at, at the end of this camp, this initial part of the campaign that we did and uh, the experience of co-hosting. So what was it like to co-host people into this bigger exploration across a wide variety of stakeholder perspectives into what is it we're really trying to do and why do we need to listen to each other? And so you can hear from other leaders, including Adrian, across the building and energy efficiency sectors um, from very different perspectives in different countries, what their experience as leaders was in taking this up. Um, we also have, um, would love to um, invite you to come listen to the UPM um, YouTube channel has the four different um, sessions that we've done where we looked at the individual, the group, the organizational level and societal level. With these, we were looking at, um, as I described earlier, this, what is the experience that you know the difference? You can see those agreements that are driving your experience towards scarcity or abundance. You can shift those agreements as an organizational mode by seeing what is it we're trying to achieve? What does life look like? What do the processes and structures look like of people who can achieve that experience we wanna have, those outcomes we want? What are we doing and how can we shift those? And then what is, what is the leadership perspective on how we need to be in that collaborative space, which we call co-hosting. And the word co-hosting very simply means I'm not holding this space like, oh, you have to do it my way. It's, I'm not saying you should do this, but I'm also not just hosting it because I'm recognizing that you're also hosting. Your perspective and your active participation are required. And so you're hosting it, the environment and the possibilities hold, hosting it, that future that we're striving toward for all of society is hosting it, all these different perspectives are hosting it. But, and my intention and relationship and attention also matter in this. So it's co-hosting that collaborative capacity together, then we can shift these agreements so that we can have a different experience and different outcomes. And so we describe this in these different sessions in a bit more detail you can go to the UPM channel um, to see the, the recordings of the different ones. And then finally, we want to invite you into um, our work at the UPM and the Institute for Strategic Clarity and Renovate of what do you see? What do you see and what would you ask of our data? So we have a bunch of data from our surveys, from the, in our knowledge base, the live labs learnings, um, a lot of data that we've collected of what these kinds of projects look like, these kinds of initiatives, surveys of what people are describing. So what would you ask of our data? What would you like to ask in our field work? As you saw in the first slides, we're doing this. Um, Adrian talked about all the different countries he's working in at the European level. We've talked about some of the different parts of the world where we're doing this. What kinds of things would you like to ask in this more abundance-based science of, of Deep, deeper collaboration and co-hosting so that we can actually achieve some of these um, solution, collaborative solutions to these wicked problems that we're facing and demonstrating that people are figuring this out around the globe. 
Um, the surveys that you can do that we described in the first session are available in an agreements health check portal. So sort of like you think about your medical records, you can go and measure for free the, the experience people are having of their of the, um, vibrancy or the experience that they're having in this set of agreements. And what happens is it shifts over time. So you can watch over time for groups and check out different groups. You have that available too. And you can join our network. Um, these are some of the organizations that are involved in our network, academic, practitioner, um, community leaders, government leaders in different parts of the world. Um, so we invite you to join us. It's very easy to do. Email me. Um, and here are our emails. This is my email. IS Clarity stands for Institute for Strategic Clarity, but it's isclarity.org and renovate-europe, EU, if you're interested in engaging. Um, and that's Adrian's. And so we invite you to um, participate and engage because that was sort of our big purpose in doing this is you know, th there's big work to do. There's exciting ways to go about doing it that seem to be more fruitful, not because it'd be a nice thing to do. And I guess I would want to finish up with that and then invite your comment your own reflections to summarize, Adrian. But mine is these things that we're, we're facing aren't things that it would be nice if we could figure out. They're big problems, they're wicked problems, meaning they're very difficult. We don't even know what really causes, we don't know if we've, ever, if we've really resolved this, but they're big challenges and they're challenges that we're all facing. And so what we're trying to figure out is what, is much, what are much more fruitful ways of going about doing that? And then what does that require of me? as a leader? What do I have to change in me and how I see the world, my assumptions about the world? How does that change what we need to change as, as our group? Because as Adrian said, and I would paraphrase, he said, I don't think people are resistant to change. People change all the time. We love new things. Just look at how many people download YouTube how-tos or all the creative, millions of creative things that people do every day and express through YouTube or Pinterest or any of these sites. So people love change. I think organizations are resistant to change. And we can change that. We said, well, what we're doing isn't achieving what we need to, to get the outcome we know where is available to us. And then that's, but that's great. It's hard, but that's great because he said, if what needs to change is how we are acting and how I am leading and how we're interacting, then we have all the power in the world to do that. Will that get us to the outcomes we want? That's the experiment. But the, the power lies in not saying, well, I'm gonna stay the way I am and they need a change. Rather, if we want that, then how can I change? And what can I shift in what we're doing and what we agree to? And that's why we call them agreements. What is it we agree to do? Because the agreements we have accepted are the ones that are giving us the outcomes we're having and the experience we're having. So we can shift these agreements and that's at this core of the science of abundance, which we're very grateful Isabel invited us into in this series of saying, if you can say yes to life, to human creativity, you're saying yes to an abundance-based approach is what we found versus a scarcity-based, there's not enough and it'll never work-based approach, which I, say, I see now as saying no to human creativity. We're saying yes. And then what can that lead to? What are some of the practices that are engaged in doing that? And we can achieve these things. So I'd love to uh, give a, a, a few, two or three minutes to you, Adrian, any reflections you're having, um, and then. You know. First of all, it's been a great pleasure to be on this call and uh, thank you those who asked questions uh, to, uh, you know, to, to dig deeper into the issues. And listening, Jim, to what you've just summarized um, brings me back to a thought, which is um, we, we're talking about change all the time and we recognize that change is needed uh, certainly in my sector for buildings and it goes back to that th to the thought that keeps coming back to my mind is we can't affect change with the thinking of today that caused or led to the issues we're dealing with and one of the things that then joins up in my mind is that we in the last 200 years since the industrial revolution have had a very linear uh, way of thinking about life, about resources, about um, occupations. I mean, there's a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we're now in, a, in a, an era where there's a realization that circularity is much more important, where we nurture and cherish and use uh, what we've got intellectually, 
physically, technically in a much smarter way. And that whole process that we have provided today is a circular approach. And I think that links nicely for me to this need for collective responsibility about what our impacts are. And if we're not questioning our actions and our agreements, as Jim calls them, then we're going to probably blindly walk into another problem we've not seen before, uh, rather than consciously addressing the issues we know with new solutions uh, so that we create a better future for all. And we can only create a better future for all if we're all involved. And I think that's kind of the reflections I would, I would wish to end on today. So thank you again, Jim, for inviting me in and thank you to the audience for your attention and, and the stimulating questions. That's great, Adrian, because I, I want to pass to Isabel, but I, I want to thank you for saying yes. And I wanted you to give a scale for folks of the, the, the volume and the scale of what you're talking about doing, right? And that you're influencing in an instrumental way with mm -hmm. your communities. And so we're not talking about just going in, can I put in a heater in my room? Right? We're talking trillions of euros for millions of buildings generating work for millions of people, right? So they're very big numbers and it's happening it's not that, oh, in the future, somebody might say yes, possibly. It's happening and it already is advancing significantly. And there are directives for this, there are national strategies for this, and there's a lot of work amongst a lot of people that are doing this work. So I thank you very much for bringing that reality and the experience of leading that kind of work um, and mm -hmm. engaging it. So thank you very much and thank you, Isabel for hosting all of this. It's great. Yeah. Thank you very much to both of you. Thank you, Adrienne, for sharing your experience with us. It was amazing for opening our eyes and our hearts as well to, to see you know, and to look in a different way. And thank you, Jim. We are in our last session. You have been with us during four afternoons. And thank you very much for encouraging us to say yes Yes to life and yes to human creativity, which we are not used to listen that and it moves us. And I hope that we will keep saying yes, yes together. Yeah? So thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much to those that they have been with us. And uh, I hope to see you soon again. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you again. Thank you to all the participants. Bless you.